please you know open with a word of prayer yeah yes ma'am sir am i audible ma'am oh yes yeah okay yes thank you ma'am okay let's pray dear heavenly father we thank you for this beautiful day beautiful time lord this morning father god we come to you father god bringing ourselves to you lord jesus as we are going to learn this lesson father god we ask you that help us to learn and understand your word father god and as we are going through this lesson we submit to become ma'am to your mighty hand jesus lead her and guide her father god as well as all the students lord jesus you lead us and guide us and what you want us to teach teach us lord thank you in jesus name we pray amen amen thank you so much uh, yeah so uh, we've uh, been looking at the epistle to the galatians and we have covered four chapters so we will cover the remaining two chapters today so we would be finishing galatians today uh, so right now we are in galatians 5 uh, if we can have one person um, reading out for, for us verses 1 to 4 galatians 5 uh, verses 1 to 4 if someone could read out we can get started right away can we trust it yeah for freedom christ has set us free stand from there for and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery look i paul say to you that if you accept circumcision christ will be of no advantage to you i testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that is obligated to keep the law whole law to what uh was for you are severe from Christ who you who would be justified by the law you have fallen away from grace okay yeah um so here we basically have paul um telling the people that there are two covenants one is a cancelled covenant the old covenant has been cancelled and now there is a new covenant uh, so in the previous four chapters he's been uh, scolding the galatians and you know telling them after i have taught you the truth and that now you are under the new covenant and that now you should place your faith in christ after having taught you all of these things why are you going back to an old cancelled covenant you know is what he has been saying to them all along in the four chapters so now he uh, kind of begins to issue warnings you know and so here in chapter 5 he is saying this is very dangerous it's not like as if there are two options available and then you just pick the one that you feel like picking um it's very uh, serious because if you are now going to place yourself under the old cancelled covenant uh, the new covenant privileges will no longer apply to you so it is a serious thing so which is why he says over here in galatians 5 verse 2 paul uh, i paul tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised christ will be of no value to you at all so all that christ has won on the cross the eternal life that he is offering free all of that is not going to apply to you any longer if you consciously say i am going to place myself under the mosaic covenant and i am going to get circumcised and i am going to earn my way into heaven so if that is your plan be warned that uh, the benefits of the new covenant will no longer be applicable at all so you got to make a choice you can't say i'll have a little bit of the new covenant and i would like to hold on to a little bit of the old cancelled covenant that does not work. it does not work that way because god cancelled out the old one uh, so it's no longer applicable so if you choose to hold on to the old one the benefits of the new one will no longer you know be applicable to you and of course the larger greater uh, risk you know in in going back to that cancelled old covenant is that nobody is ever going to be able to keep it and we've you know looking at that james chapter 2 verse 10 all along just to you know get gain clarity where it very very plainly says whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it so uh, these judaizers who are saying that we should go back to the mosaic covenant and observe that 
while holding on still to the new one. You know, they want to have a little bit of both. So he's basically pointing out that under the old covenant, they are going to make a mess because they will at least stumble in one or two laws. And then when they stumble in those one or two laws, it, it's as if they have broken the entire mosaic law. So there's no way they're going to gain God's active acceptance by obeying the law. And at the same time, they would have lost out on the benefits of the new covenant. So he says, what you're trying to do over here is very dangerous. He says in verse 4, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Imagine it's like as if you are choosing to be cut off from Christ. And the grace which is being offered will no longer be applicable to you. So he is now becoming very uh, serious in the words that he is using uh, because he uh, wants them to understand that it is a matter of life and death that's going on over here. Okay, so he needs them to understand the urgency. Um, so uh, you can choose to be saved by the law or you can choose to be saved by grace. If you say, I want to be saved by the law, grace is no longer applicable to you. Okay, so um, that's the issue that he is now uh, raising here. Uh, so then we would go into verses 5 and 6. But before we do that, uh, yes, if we can have um, uh, Charles asking his question. Yeah, go ahead, Charles. Okay, thank you so much, Pastor. Um, uh, the law and the grace and the people, that there is a group of people that are no longer reading the Old, the Old Testament because of the book of Galatians. So what is your say about it? Like the old covenant is no longer working, even the, the writings that he, um, you remember, I, I don't remember where, I think it is in Colossians where they said that there was a, a, a handwriting that was um, condemning us and he removed it. So they are saying that the writing that was condemning us, which is the Old Testament, uh, is is really bad so they no longer even read it they read the new testament only what is your say pastor uh like we saw in one of the previous sessions the law had a purpose it served its purpose it served its function it was supposed to serve as a guardian it was supposed to serve as a tutor it was supposed to show the israelites and all the other people you know who chose to come under it uh it, it showed them that on their own, they can never ever really uh, become acceptable in God's eyes because they will end up at least, you know, um, breaking some of the laws. And in fact, later in one, in uh, even as we are going to be covering chapter five and six, we will see that even Paul, uh, you know, at one point, uh, he, he says um, that, you know, I was faultless in keeping the law quite a statement to make okay because i mean there would be eyewitnesses uh, seeing whether uh, what he is saying is true or not so he says you know back then when i was still following judaism i was faultless in keeping the law and even him after you know having so faultlessly keeping all of those mosaic laws he too could not acquire salvation uh, through that method so the law is was is not evil it had a function to perform. It was meant to show people who are being really faultless in their in their keeping of the law that while they may be keeping the letter of the law, my, they have broken the spirit, the spirit of the law, which is you know behind those. Because you can maybe go through a set of rituals and uh, outwardly really try your best to stay in line with those things, but in your heart. Are you able to keep, uh, you know, keep your heart in line with the law? For instance, you know, you really hate somebody, and um, uh, the, you know, the, the law says you must not strike them, you must not call them fool, you must not uh, murder. So you refrain from doing that. You are a godly person, and you want to stay in line with the law. So you're so careful to keep the law, but in your heart there is this hatred which is just surging and you have no control over it because you see you're still the old sinful spirit and um, you have not been renewed by Christ. So on your own, you may struggle and struggle, but 
in your heart you have not overcome so paul had all these all this dirt inside he had jealousy he had the spirit of competitiveness and he he had all of these things which he had no control over and that's why he says in romans 7 you know he says i ah, i really wanted to to you know, to obey the law but it's like as if there's a part of me which which i had no control over and so i you know i came to a point where i cried out and said is there any hope for someone like me and then he goes on to talk about the new covenant and how the new covenant you know changed his life uh, so um so the law is a good thing but the law the function of the law the main function of the law was to point out to us that on our own we can never follow the commandments of god we need a renewal we literally need to be reborn into a new person and something which christ alone can do when we when that happens then through the power of the holy spirit we will be able to start fulfilling the law because now in chapters 5 and 6 in two three places paul says that we believers are fulfilling the law in fact he says we are fulfilling the entire law so the law was never ever considered as evil it was god given god i know but in the old testament it they served the function of tutor to show people that they can never keep it on their own they are we humans are fully dependent on the lord and it's only through his enabling power will we ever be able to fully fu- uh, you know uh, fulfill the law and in fact in galatians 5 and 6 paul goes on to say you know what you walk in line with the spirit you'll actually fulfill the law so um i guess that would be my take on uh, how we should look at the law uh in the new testament would that is that helpful yes it is thank you pastor yeah so all right then in that case we'll continue uh so if someone could read out for us galatians chapter 5 uh and we're looking at verses 5 and 6 if someone could read out let me read for yes. we through the spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith when Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love amen yes so here uh, he he says uh, you know um, if you choose to be under the grace under the new covenant then you know you can eagerly await the righteousness for which you hope for and because it will be given to you you know your 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 wait will not be in vain uh, what you're waiting for eagerly you will receive and over here when he's talking about the righteousness for which we hope um he's talking about righteousness at two levels um maybe we could uh, if someone could read out for us jude uh, verse 24 you know jude has only one chapter so jude verse 24 if someone could read out Can you read the passage? Yeah. Child, go ahead. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Yeah, I think she kind of got muted or something. So yeah, we'll we'll just go ahead. Um so in Jude 24, um there are two kinds of righteousness being mentioned over here. you know it's talking about um, uh, jesus christ to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault okay so um this righteousness which is you know made available to us on a daily basis as in even as we cooperate with the spirit of god uh, you know uh, jesus helps us uh, not to stumble he helps us to live in a way that honors the lord so he keeps us from stumbling he helps us to live in a righteous manner so we have this daily hope that christ is going to be there is going to help me today from uh, and keep me from stumbling he will cause me to be righteous you know in my thoughts in my speech in my actions so we have that hope on a daily basis we also have this uh, hope that we are looking to you know that day when we stand in front of uh, uh, god 
uh, at that time jesus christ will present us before his glorious presence without fault because that day when we stand there we will stand clothed in the righteousness of christ completely faultless okay so uh, this is the hope that we have and this hope is available only to those who are under the new covenant um, uh, because he goes on to say in verse 6 galatians 5 verse 6 he says uh, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value so if you get circumcised it doesn't mean that god is going to you know um, grant you salvation at the same time if you say oh, okay i choose to be uncircumcised that doesn't you know gain you plus points in any way with god so circumcision and a, un, uncircumcision both of them are not going to gain you any kind of plus points with god what is the only thing that is going to help you get your salvation the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love okay genuine faith there is a faith which a lot of people have uh, which is just a fake faith now that will not lead to salvation but there is something called genuine faith and that genuine faith that will automatically express itself through love so if you have that kind of a genuine faith then yes that is the only way you're going to uh, gain god's approval and gain entry into his kingdom so it's, it's what is being told over here um so what exactly is this faith which expresses itself through love um and you know uh, james again uh, explains to us what exactly is genuine faith of course we're all very familiar with this you know with these passages uh, but let's just you know take a look at it uh, as more as a reminder to ourselves of what actually faith should look like so james chapter 2 uh, verses 20 to 24 which talk about what actual genuine faith looks like james 2 20 to 24 please james 2 20 to 24 you foolish person do you want evidence that faith do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless was not our father abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's Frank. 24? Sorry, 24. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Okay, now uh, if you misinterpret this, this passage, you know, you could um, go down a completely wrong track. So uh, it's so important to understand what is being said over here. Uh, in no way is this passage saying that uh, you know you need to add works to your faith to gain salvation uh, this passage very much is very very clearly saying that salvation is by faith alone the good works that you and i do cannot earn salvation for us because our good works will never be good enough in god's eyes okay so you do not earn salvation by good works but there is a point being made over here about what kind of faith a person needs to have so over here he he says um, you know you you uh, you know james who is talking to his uh, audience he says you foolish person do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless and uh, so then he goes on to say he gives the example of abraham now abraham uh, was he says in verse 21 james 2 21 abraham was considered righteous uh, for what he did okay but we also know uh, according to you know genesis chapter 15 that when god uh, credited righteousness to abraham it was not because of anything that abraham did but simply because of what he believed god takes him out under the you know night sky and says look up at the sky look at all the stars innumerable stars start counting them 
you'll never finish counting because there are that many stars. And uh, so Abraham chooses to, even the, the man who cannot even bear one child yet, he chooses to believe that God who made a promise will keep it. And so because he believes in God, it is credited to him as righteousness. So at that point of time, he had not done any deeds at all. But that man, that faith which he exercised on, on a standing over there under the night sky, that was genuine faith. God who looked into his heart, discerned his heart, and saw that the faith which he is expressing is genuine faith. And so later on, um, you know, when the trials and tests come along, at that time, when the when this when this faith is tested, when this faith is tried, it will be proven as genuine. Circumstances will prove that this man's faith is genuine. So the proof of it will come later, you know, when, when he has to act out his faith, right? When he has to take a stand for certain things, uh, when, he, when he has to make certain choices on that day, it will be clearly proved whether, the, you know, the faith which he has now exercised is genuine or not. And God, even before he performed any of those deeds, you know, before, he, before Abraham performed any of those good deeds, God already knew that the faith which he has ex expressed right now is genuine. And so in that moment itself, God credits it to him as righteousness. So in verse James chapter 2, verse 22, where it says, you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. It's not saying that if you do good works and you attach them, you know, you do the mosaic law and get circumstances and do all of that and you attach that to your faith, only then salvation comes. It's not saying that. What it is saying is that if a person's faith is genuine, it will be completed each time you do works because it will show that you are a person who has genuinely submitted to the Lord you genuinely are trusting him and obeying him. You genuinely have made your walk with him and you're not going to change your mind. So all your actions will continue to prove again and again that yours is a complete faith. Yours is a genuine faith. On the other hand, if you know um, the faith which you expressed in the beginning was fake, you know, it was just as this momentary um, um, you know, burst of feeling just an emotional burst of feeling, not really backed up by any decision that you have made in your heart that from now on, I choose to trust Christ and follow him. If you've not done that, and it's just a fake faith, later on, you know, when, when uh, the tests and trials come along, you will not take a stand for Christ. Uh, and then it will be shown that your faith is incomplete. So um, it's not saying that works complete your faith uh, 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 as in gaining your salvation. The works only prove whether, first of all, your faith was genuine in the first place or not. So in that sense, in verse 23, James 2, 23, scripture was fulfilled. So when this man was willing to take his child and you know sacrifice him, I mean, was getting ready to sacrifice him on the altar, at that time, it proved very, very clearly that the faith which he had expressed long ago, many years back when he was standing under the night sky, what faith he had expressed at that time was very much genuine. And so now this, this event where he's standing near the altar, next to the altar, raising up the knife to kill his son, even as he's standing over there getting ready to do that, you know, it shows that the scripture was indeed fulfilled, that this man who had placed his faith at that time was indeed, uh, 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 it was a genuine act. And uh, so when God credited to him as righteousness, it is indeed the correct thing that was done. So all that is proved now because of the actions which he you know, um, demonstrated many, many years later. And so verse 24, James 2, 24, he says, uh, James says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So here, coming back to our Galatians chapter 5, um, and uh, we are looking at verse 6, when it says, only thing which counts for salvation is a faith which expresses itself through love. That is the kind of faith that Paul is saying. Whether you get circumcised or not, uh, that is not going to gain you plus points. 
the only thing that can gain you your salvation is faith, a genuine faith. How does a genuine faith uh, behave? It expresses itself in love. So then he goes on to explain what does he mean by, you know, expresses itself in uh, love. Um, I mean, um, uh, yeah, I think someone is not muted. Um, Uh, it, it does a, everyone have a kind of you know a bad transmission going on i mean are uh, most of you able to hear what i am saying and you know and kind of get because um we have maxon saying that he has a poor network so it's not really anything at my end right okay perfect okay so yeah we, we can go on then uh yeah and uh yes May the Lord, you know, give Maxon a good network. Lord, you please help him because he wants to be part of this class. And so, Lord, you just assist him and guide him so that his network clears up. Lord, you do that for him. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, just to uh, clarify this further, uh, you know, if someone could read out for us James 2.19, you know, that's just the verse that he mentions before he gets into the Abraham example. So if someone could just read out James 2, 19, please. Can I read, Pastor? Yes. Uh, thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devil also believe and from thee. Yeah, so over here, um, the demons believe in the in God and, and in his divinity to such an extent that it makes them tremble. It scares them, it frightens them. To that extent, they believe in God. But that belief uh, is an incomplete faith because that belief never led them to submit to the Lord. It never led them to trust in the Lord and you know just let him be God and let them just be created beings. No. So you see, their faith, they have great faith. They have so much faith in God that they literally tremble. But it's an incomplete faith because it doesn't uh, express itself in submission. It doesn't express itself in obedience. On the other hand, if you look at Abraham, when the, when, the, when, the, when the time came where he had to submit and obey, he was ready because his faith was complete. It was a genuine faith. Okay, So you see, that's the contrast. And um, then, in fact, you know, Hebrews 11, verses 17 to 19, in fact, go on to explain what kind of a faith this man had. Uh, and I think that is important for us to look at. Um, yeah. If someone could read out Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, please. Can I read the question? Yeah. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was in the act of offering of his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be made. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessing on Jacob and his son. Okay, so um, uh, we have. Um, you know, Abraham being described over here in verse 17, Hebrews 11, 17, he who had embraced the promises that day when God made him a promise under the night sky, he just embraced that promise. He accepted it. He fully believed it. He believed in the God who is making that promise and he believed that, yes, God will fulfill it. It's true that in all these years, I have not had a child. I've grown old now. But God says that my descendants are going to be so innumerable, I will not even be able to count them. I just choose to believe this. He embraced the promises. So this man who has embraced the promises is now getting ready to kill the very son through whom all these descendants are going to come. So the level of his faith is such that this is the way he reasons it out in his mind. You know, that's what verse 19 explains. It says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. So his reasoning was, God made a promise. God will not lie. And uh, so it's all right. Even if I sacrifice my son, 
God is going to raise my dead son back to life because God has made a promise because God so clearly has said, you know, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So obviously, uh, descendants are not going to come from a dead dead boy, right? The boy has to come back to life. And so his reasoning is so amazing. You know, he had not yet heard about the Lazarus story. He had not yet heard about the widow's son being raised from the dead. All these things would happen many centuries later. This man, as far as he, had, uh, as far as we know, had never ever witnessed anyone rising from the dead. But there he stands confidently next to the altar, gets ready to kill his son because he believes he has embraced the promise and he knows that God will be faithful to his word. And so he says, no props. I will sacrifice my son because God will raise him up from the dead because God will keep his promise. And just as God has said, through Isaac, you know, uh, my offspring will be uh, reckoned. You know, so that is the level of faith that he had. So that was genuine faith. And now here, uh, when, when, Paul is talking about genuine faith. He is talking about an other aspect. Okay, so the aspect that really comes out with the, in the Abraham story is uh, Abraham's love for God and Abraham's trust in God. Now over here, Paul is talking about another aspect of genuine faith. Uh, you know, which he goes on to explain in verses thirteen to fifteen. And uh, yeah, we have. Uh, uh, I think you did tell me how to pronounce your name once, but then I don't remember. Uh, but yeah, uh, man, man, gi, ge, is it or je? Man, yeah. If you know, if you could tell me how to pronounce your name, and then go ahead with your question, please. Uh, it's Mangi. Ge, min, mangi. It's... Fine. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Go ahead with your question, please. Thank you, Pastor. Um, like as you, you, were, you were teaching us about, about Abraham's faith. Um, such question, Pastor. Uh, did Abraham not believe because he he was communing with God? There was no one in between him and God. But now we, we, we have the Bible, we have the Holy Spirit, but most people, they, they don't really understand what they believe. They don't really have communion with God. So Abraham had personal relationship with God. God will come visit him, will speak to him, will show him. Uh, can that not have, did that not affect the way he believed God? Because he had that relationship with God. Please, please help me. Thank you. Uh, I am sure that Abraham had a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, re relationship with God. Uh, where he seemed to be so interested in the things of God and so in line with the heart of God, where God says to himself, you know, before destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, how can I withhold that information from him? I need to share this with him. So I think they really had a good relationship going where God felt obligated to tell this man about something which he's going to be doing. So he actually comes to Abraham and says, you know what, these are my plans. And he actually shares his divine plans with a mere human being because that human being was in such in so much in line with him and and they, 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 he had such a good relationship with his god but uh, abraham did not have all of the scriptures in front of him the the level of revelation which we have today he did not even have uh, because you know we see that in the old testament only a partial revelation was given what we know today in the new testament is much more a much fuller revelation has been given to us and also in, in at that time it was just god visiting abraham every time abraham reaches out to god god reaches out to him and comes to him and communes with him but he didn't have the indwelling of the holy spirit so actually uh, abraham was at a disadvantage we today can actually have a more intimate relationship with God than Abraham ever could have had in his day. Um, so, because we literally have, uh, you know, it's where, where, where um, in John, you know, where, where Jesus says, I and my father will come. And I think it is probably either John 15 or John 17. Where, where, you know, Jesus says, I and my father will come and make a home in you. So we literally have them residing in us, you know, through the spirit of God. So we literally have the spirit of God inside us. 
and we have all of scripture uh, you know literally speaking to us the holy spirit inspires the scripture and you know uh, causes us to understand what is being said and so there's a deeper level of communication happening so abraham didn't really have all of that but at his primitive level my goodness what faith that man had we on the other hand who have access to the scriptures uh, you know uh, that many words of god we have you know available to us and the script the holy spirit is available to enlighten all of those words to us and make it relevant to our present day situations so our level of intimacy with him uh, with god must be should be at a much higher level than what abraham had yeah uh, you know we have we are at an advantage um, so yes so yes now come uh, does that help would you, would you you know ha, would you have any follow up questions thank you for that help okay yeah thank perfect you. yeah so we'll uh, then i know uh, get into verses 13 to 15 if someone could quickly read out that for us please Let me read. Yes. Um uh, verse 13 to 15 for you brethren have been called to liberty only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself but if you bite and devour one another Beware, lest you con- you be consumed by another. For you, brethren, have been called to oh, liberty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, now here in these verses, um, you know, Paul is saying the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command: love your neighbor as yourself. So you know, he's telling you know, you people, please keep this commandment. now we you know all along for four chapters uh, for four and a half chapters paul has been saying don't follow the mosaic law anymore uh, that is not how you gain salvation uh, and so you know he's been um, telling them not to follow the mosaic law and now here he says the entire mosaic law can be fulfilled if you just keep one single commandment you know uh, and that which is to love your neighbor and now he says keep it keep this commandment so what is paul saying is he is telling us to follow the mosaic law or is he saying don't follow the mosaic law you know so um that is the question which gets raised but before we answer that you know let's look at what jesus himself also said okay so john chapter 15 if someone could read out verses 9 to 12 john 15 verses 9 to 12 please John 15:9 to 12 It reads As the Father has loved me so I have loved you Now remain in my love If you keep my commands you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete verse 12 my command is this love each other as i have loved you amen so we have both paul and jesus clearly saying you believers must keep one commandment which commandment is that to love each other uh, you know even as god has loved us so um, this is a command that we are being expected to keep uh but neither paul nor jesus is saying that salvation will come by keeping this commandment okay you are keeping this commandment for a different purpose okay in the old testament god told the israelites please keep the mosaic law observe all the 613 mosaic laws which i have given you because if you do that then i will consider you acceptable in my eyes okay so that was for the old testament old covenant people but here once we have come into the new covenant jesus cancelled the old covenant 
now he says if you want to be acceptable uh, you know uh, to god uh, keeping the mosaic law will not suffice because you anyway will not be able to keep it perfectly there is a solution you need to come and place your faith in jesus christ jesus christ will you know declare you as righteous and then on a day to day basis he will help you to actually become righteous okay so um so that is the you know uh, root to salvation which we follow the judaizers basically were saying okay so you have the judaizer root to salvation and you have jesus root to salvation let's look at the two you know so the judaizers root to salvation basically goes like this uh keep all the laws of uh, moses get circumcised you no know, keep all of those laws if you do that you enter into step 2 which is you have now fulfilled the entire law so then once you fulfill the entire law then you come into step 3 where you know you have access to god you are able to enter into heaven you, know, you are now part of god's family so those are the three steps which the judaizers were recommending on the other hand what is the route to salvation which jesus christ has laid down he says step 1 please believe in me that what i did on the cross is sufficient for your salvation if you place your faith in me and if you submit to me and accept me as your lord and savior i will declare you as righteous whatever i have done on the cross is sufficient and enough for your salvation you don't need to do anything additional so step 1 you got to believe this and just submit to me and you know begin to live for me so that is step 1 when you do that you enter into step 2 which is um you know you you gain access to god you know you become acceptable to him now once you have the salvation experience and you have now become acceptable to god then you enter into the third step you choose to continue remaining in his love you choose to continue enjoying the full extent of his love by you know um um by keeping this commandment of loving each other so that's that's the aspect which jesus christ you know brings out in john chapter 15 where he says the way i remain in my father's love always is by keeping his commandment so you don't keep the commandments of the lord to gain salvation ah you know uh, uh brother charles if you could kind of mute yourself uh i don't know how to do that okay i need to figure this out later um but yeah you know the the, the noise was kind of affecting yeah so um so according to the judaizers uh you gain salvation you earn salvation by keeping the mosaic law and they're completely wrong in that on the other hand what jesus is saying and what paul is saying is that once you have salvation one of the by products of the salvation is that you will be able to start loving each other and uh, that will be a by product of your salvation so god is very very serious about us loving each other but you're not doing that to earn the salvation you're doing it because you have salvation so you better behave like a saved person and live in love with your fellow uh, believers okay so um let your faith be a genuine faith which shows up in your actions so if your faith is really genuine you will behave like a true believer and you will actually live in love with your fellow believers okay so the when you the, the way you behave you're living with your fellow believers will will clearly demonstrate whether or not your your faith first of all was genuine or not you know when you first made that commitment to the lord okay so that's the um that's the aspect which is being brought out over here um so he now because now, now that he's introduced this whole idea of how important it is for us to demonstrate the genuineness of our faith by living in love he goes on to elaborate on this whole idea of uh what exactly is living in love how do you do it what are the implications so the rest of the you know passage is going to be talking about living in love and the importance of that uh, okay so uh, up to now he's talked about uh, the first 
portion, which, you know, uh, the first argument where he established that salvation is never, ever going to come to you by keeping the Mosaic law. It's only going to come to you by faith. So faith alone will lead to salvation. He has established that. Now he's getting into part two. Part two, what he is saying is, now that you people are saved, let's hope that the, you know, the, the faith which you are expressing is genuine. Because if it is genuine, it's definitely going to show up in the way you treat one another. So right now, if you're living you know, in enmity with the other believers, and you have all this hatred and jealousy and dissension inside you, you need to start changing yourself. Kindly renew your mind. Kindly renew your attitude and start coming in line with scripture because you are now a saved person. No longer should you be living the way the world, the worldly people live because now you have become a child of God. So now start living like a child of God. So right now, so now he starts giving instructions on how a saved person should be behaving. Okay, so we will look at that when we come back uh, from our break. So at 10 o'clock, if we all can just log back in once again, you know, we'll uh, continue with the lesson. Thank you.